Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. We're excited that you're here today. Uh, I see some uh, Christmas uh, festive gear out there. Uh, I don't know if anybody beats our youth pastor Sam uh, today. He's got like a onesie on. But uh, everyone else is looking good. You know, Brian said we should wear our ugly Christmas sweaters, but I don't have any ugly Christmas sweaters. All I have are Star Wars themed beautiful Christmas sweaters. So, you know, you do what you can, I guess. Uh, but we do want to welcome you to church today. Uh, whether you're here in the room or you're online, we are all here to gather, to celebrate our Savior, to celebrate that He has come and that He has life abundant and uh, He's offering it to us. And so, would you stand with us because uh, we get the opportunity to worship together as a church. So let's sing some Christmas songs together. Let's be excited about Jesus.
to the world, joy to the world. Maybe it just feels different. It's just kind of—it's like it's in the air. That whenever it's Christmas time, we just feel a little bit different. And I think sometimes what it does in my mind and my my heart is it just kind of makes me realize how off maybe the world is compared to what it should be. Because sometimes we sing about these things like joy to the world and, and peace and goodwill towards men, and, and then we see the brokenness in our culture and, and in our world. And it just can kind of deflate you for a moment. But I think what's so important for us to remember during this season is how God is such a faithful God. And that we see the evidence of his faithfulness all throughout history. And the thing that I think about is, is put yourself in the shoes of, of the people during that first Christmas season when Jesus was born and the sense of desperation because what we see is there's this period of time where it's nearly 400 years that they refer to it as really the period of silence. It's this time that takes place between when the last prophet prophesied in the Old Testament and then the events of the New Testament took place. And a lot of times uh, you think about that and you think, man, what would that be like? God was silent for nearly 400 years. And there, there are things that happen during that time period that, uh, that they believe God acted in, and that's a lot of what the, uh, the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah uh, celebrates uh, during this time of the year. But I, I think the thing to remember is that while we might have those same longings every once in a while, we feel the weight of the world, that it's not as it should be. The difference that we have between the people in that time and now is that we have the Spirit of God with us at all times. That yes, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth, but he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And we have access to God at any time. And so while you might feel this season, maybe some of the, the weight of it, that the world is not maybe as it should be, recognize and know that we have a God who cares, a God who is faithful. And this next song that we're going to do is one of longing, one where we sing and, and we reminisce about how they so expectedly waited for that coming Savior. And we're going to be reminded of the faithfulness of God on the screen because what we're going to have is there's an artist that's going to paint throughout. And it's just going to remind us of the ways that God has showed up and proven his faithfulness over and over again. And so maybe today that's the reminder that you need because maybe you feel like you're losing a little bit of hope this season or maybe you feel like you're just a little bit worn out. And so we just want you to find rest today, not because we're singing a song, not because it's nice and warm in here, but we want you to find rest in Jesus Christ because he's the one who truly is the one who can provide peace in your life and hope. And so as we sing these songs, just be moved by these images on the screen and be reminded that we anxiously wait for our Savior to return.
Please be seated as we prepare for communion. Well, in a few short days, it's going to be Christmas. <laughs> Woo! Man, I'm so excited. And not only that, it's, it's an incredible time where we get to celebrate Jesus' birthday. The birth of Jesus, and it is awesome. It, it, it's a time in where we, we remember. We remember the manger. We remember the shepherds in the field and the star. Uh, we drive around and see houses decorated with beautiful lights and trees and Christmas trees in the windows. We eat lots of cookies <laughs> and drink lots of eggnog because eggnog is fantastic. But Christmas, Christmas is only the beginning. It's only the beginning, because in a few short months, it's Easter. And it's a time that we remember the cross. But more importantly, we celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead, that he conquered death for us. And before this event happens, he gathers his disciples in a room. He sits them down at a table and they have a meal. And, and we, we can read about what he says and what happens in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. He says, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So let's celebrate the birth of Jesus. Let's eat cookies, drink eggnog, but remember the cross and celebrate the resurrection. And know that because of what Jesus did, because the work he did on that cross over 2,000 years ago, that those of us have placed our faith in him, we will have an eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that is worth celebrating. I'm going to step back here in just a moment and, and give you a, some time to take the elements, reflect, and remember.
Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this time that we can celebrate the birth of your son, but also celebrate the resurrection and the defeat of death on that cross. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's check out what's going on at Summit today. Hey, Summit, how cool was that just to get to enjoy some Christmas music together? And we're going to enjoy some more, and we're going to talk about Jesus and his birth at our Christmas Eve services. We have five services coming up. Two of them are on the 23rd, and three are on the 24th. So we want to invite you to be able to come out to those and uh, be able to make room for lots of people and friends and family and invite neighbors. We're going to have a great time. I want to celebrate one thing that I don't know if I've ever heard of in the history of church, and that is we have five services. We needed tons of volunteers. We put out the word, and all of the volunteer positions got filled. So I'm, I'm relatively new here, so I don't know if that's a normal summit thing, but that's not normal for me. I want to give like a hoot and a holler just to celebrate all the volunteers. They're going to give their time on that weekend. Can you give the hoot and the holler? Can I hear it? Okay. All right, I'm going to assume there was some good hooting and hollering there because I know you, and that's great. Um, but also, another great thing happened this week. We also let you know there was a need for coats. We were raising coats uh, for... It sounds like we were raising sheep. We, were, we weren't raising coats. We were asking for coats um, for the biological parents of foster kids as they go through a ch really challenging time in their life. We wanted to support them and have them have one less worry on their mind about how they're going to stay warm in the winter. So we asked for 100 coats. And as usual, Summit Church delivered. You guys donated more than double that. And we were able to really bless a lot of people this week. So we're super excited about that. The generosity of this church continues to just bring the name of Jesus into our community and people are learning that Jesus loves them because of what you're doing. It's really awesome. And I just want to address generosity as well at this time. Um, there are many people that fuel the ministry of this church and as you give, we take 10% of that and we make sure that that goes out the doors completely as we reach the community. And uh, we just want to let you know if you ha are considering giving for the first time, we want to let you know how you can do that, and it's going to be up on the screen right now, how you can give um, and be a part. Really, you're investing in the kingdom of God, and we're so excited for how we get to work together and do more than we could ever do on our own as we come together and let people know that Jesus loves them in our community. And now, would you bow your heads as we pray for Pastor Brian and his message? Father, I'm so thankful that we get to come together and learn from your word, and we just pray that you're blessing Brian as he shares, and bless each one of us as we turn our ears to the word of God. Help us learn uh, more about you and bring your spirit here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. How are you guys this morning? Whoa, didn't expect that. That's awesome. Um, Hey, a couple of things. Number one, I'm Brian, and I'm one of the pastors here, and this is my uh, Hawaiian Christmas shirt, so it's not an ugly Christmas sweater. I've been called out on that, but I just want to live in transparency and say, I like this shirt, so I wore it, and last night I wore a sweater, and I was really hot, so that's why I'm doing that, but I do appreciate seeing some of your Christmas sweaters, even if they are Star Wars themed, whatever, Josh, okay? Um, <laughs> If you're new here, we would love you to stick around after I've insulted you. Um, we would love for you to stick around, hopefully I haven't, uh, and, and text NEW to the number on the screen so we can follow up with you and let you know more about our church, hear more about your story, um, and just get to know you a little bit better. So make sure to do that because we love that there are new folks here. And uh, if you stick around with us, you're going to hear this, uh, our purpose quite often. Uh, we are here uh, to live the adventure in Christ and invite others in. Like, walking with Jesus is an incredible adventure. And, uh, and we love the adventure of saying yes to Christ and figuring out what it looks like to walk with him and invite others in, and just the kind of the craziness that that brings, especially during the holidays. And I want to share two adventures that, that we've had in this last week. The first one, our kids' ministry put together an event called uh, uh, Winter Breakout, and, and they set up this whole area here to look like first century Bethlehem. They had like people in character, so Roman soldiers, um, and, and then uh, they had three wise men. But I know those guys, so it's the three wise guys, not really wise men, way different. Um, and they had folks, little kids walking around and stuff. And I came here, and in the parking lot, I had trouble finding parking. And I came in on Thursday night, and, the, and they said they told me they had over 700 people at the event. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. 
It was so cool, and, and some of you left your kids, and you can pick them up this morning um, after church. Um, that's been weird, but we've dealt with it. Um, and, and the cool thing about that is it wasn't just our church folks that came. Uh, you guys invited friends, family, coworkers, and said, hey, you got to come check this out. And so tons of families, and it was incredible. And then last night, our street team, um, our outreach team, went out and, and went Christmas caroling. Um, that's an adventure anymore because Nevadans have guns, and, and you're knocking on their doors at night, you know. Um, so they went out, and they, they got to sing Christmas carols and invite people to our Christmas Eve services. And I just think it's cool, too, as Brad shared, that our Christmas Eve services, all of our volunteer positions are full. That is enormous. And I just want to say, way to go, church. Like, it's cool. Yeah, praise God. Last, last week, uh, Susie, our volunteer coordinator, came and told me, said, hey, you got to stop talking about volunteers for Christmas Eve services because people are coming out and we're like, we don't have any space for you, and they get a little bit frustrated. I said, well, I can't because I recorded it. It was a video. So if you got frustrated in that and you want to serve, man, just show up and we'll find something for you to do, and it's going to be awesome. Now, um, oh, the other thing. There are two things, this time of confession, two things that I wish I were good at or, or could do in my life. I wish I could dance. And some of you were here a few months ago when I did that, and there's things pushing back against my ability to dance, namely age, gender, and ethnicity. So I can't do much about that. So it's just a pipe dream at this point. The second thing I wish I could do is paint, and not just paint walls, but wasn't that worship video kind of thing that's absolutely incredible? And, and all three hours now, as I've been here and watched that, at some point I get a little misty-eyed. Because the story of God just, just uh, kind of painted like that is absolutely incredible. And so that is fun, and I'm excited where Josh, our, our new worship pastor, is taking us. Now, next month, we're going to get in that building, right? And I can't wait. Yeah, praise God for that. That has been a long time coming, like over three years of dreaming, talking. You guys, for the last two and a half years, we've all lived sacrificially. And, and this means, though, as we move into that place, we're going to leave this space, and last week during worship, I got to thinking about all of the things that have happened in this worship center. Now, this is just an ordinary building on top of some ordinary Nevada dirt, but things have happened here that are incredible. Like, just consider how many times as a church in the last 20 years we have worshiped in this space. Just think about the number of times the Word of God has been preached from the stage. Or the number of people that have come in, broken up in life, and found hope and healing in here. Think about the number of people that have given their life to Jesus in this space, or, or marriages restored, or addicts healed, or sins that have been confessed. Like, if these walls could talk, ew, right? Like that kind of thing. Because you're a bunch of sinners, you're all messy, so am I, and we come in doing stupid stuff, and we confess that stuff, and like, if these walls could talk, holy moly. Think about the number of, of communion crackers that have been consumed here. Think about the number of communion cups that have been spilled. You know who you are. Right? This carpet could talk, right? How about, how about the number of people that have been baptized right over there in 20 years? Like, praise God for that. So I want to do this. I was excited about this. I thought about this last night. If something spiritually significant has happened to you in this space, would you just put your hand up? Yeah. Praise God. This is awesome. And those of you online, you can click, I guess. I'd, let me just raise your hand. Um, but here's the deal. This is an ordinary space that God has done some extraordinary things in. And it's going to be kind of hard to leave. Like, we're excited about the new space, absolutely 100%, like, pumped, amped. I go in that building, don't tell anyone, and, and I walk around, and I dream, and I see it, and I'm excited. But there's also some things that have happened here that I'm going to miss. Right? It's kind of like when you, you leave your childhood home, and, and, and you move on. And, and you know when the building, like the room is, is or the, the house is empty and everything's packed up, and you start looking around, you look down the hallway and you remember the ding in the wall that happened. Or, or the cabinets are a little used and abused, and that one's got that, that creaky kind of front cover because, well, you yanked on it too hard at one point and broke it off, and dad kind of glued it back together. Or, or you open up the pantry, and, and in the, the, the door jam there are the marks from, from your heights when you were growing up. I, I got tired of being remorseful over those, and I went to Home Depot, and I got a stick that we use. It's also a good obedience tool. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not. Um, but we mourn a little bit as we leave this place behind, right? Because this is just an ordinary place, but God has done extraordinary things in this place. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about how God uh, does extraordinary things with the ordinary things in our lives, 
where, where God is able to take the ordinary things and, and do something incredible with them. Like when we look through scripture, we see God taking an ordinary fisherman and saying, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And he becomes a, a preacher, and in his first sermon that Peter preaches, 3,000 people come to Christ that day. Or, or God takes a, a normal, ordinary uh, young guy named Timothy and makes him an incredible church leader. Or he takes a, a guy that was a, a murderer and zealous for his Jewish faith and turns him into a missionary, church planter, preacher, pastor, and author of much of the New Testament. We're talking about Paul. What God did was take some ordinary people and do extraordinary things in their lives. Right? And in the hands of the master, ordinary becomes extraordinary. We've been talking about this and, and hanging in 1 Corinthians 127. This is God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. This is our story. We're those foolish things, those weak things that God has used in astounding ways. And I want to be clear on this. God uses us in astounding ways, not because of how awesome we are, not because of how great we are, not because of what we have to offer, but because of who God is. Because of how mighty God is, how powerful God is, how much he loves us. He takes those ordinary things and does extraordinary things in our lives if we allow him. But the reality is we're kind of messy. Like I've talked about that. We're all a mess. Like we, we bring our own levels of brokenness to every party we go to, every interaction that we're a part of. When we bring insecurities and, and sometimes anger and judgmental thoughts, but we're Christians so we never articulate those. We do. And we bring all of that stuff and like we just kind of bring brokenness. Like let's start with the basic. Let's just go to the kitchen sink. How many times have you bought, brought brokenness to a plate or a cup while doing dishes in the kitchen sink? Right? Like we're washing those things or you're putting them away from the dishwasher. Like you just, we break stuff. And then you figure, well, we bought 40 of them for five bucks at Ikea, so that's okay. But around 500 years ago, the, the Japanese folks said, hey, let's do something with those broken pieces of pottery. Let's do something with the teacups and the teapots that are broken. Let's glue them back together, but not just glue them with like Gorilla Glue or Super Glue from Home Depot. They actually started, they, they took lacquer and, and mixed it with precious metals and used that to, to repair the seams in the broken uh, pots. And, and they took what was broken and they put it back together in this form that's called Kintsugi. And, and they take something that is broken and make it even more uh, beautiful and valuable. Right, like rather than hiding the cracks, they're accentuated, they're celebrated. And these ordinary pieces of pottery become extraordinary and also extraordinarily valuable. Right, the very foolish things, the, the broken pottery become extraordinary as they're put back together. And I see in this idea of Kintsugi art, like this strong parallel in the Christmas story where Jesus entered the world, God in the flesh, entering time and space. It's like the story of the pieces of Kintsugi pottery. See, in the Bible, things were created perfect. In Genesis 1 and 2, creation is perfect. God looks at it and says, this is good. He looks at it and says, we're very good. And he's living in communion with Adam and Eve, and everything is as it should be. And then we get to chapter 3, and there's this shattering of creation because they made a decision to sin, to go against God's wishes. And when sin entered the world, everything broke. It's like sand in the gear work, sand in the engine, just destroys things, and everything is broken into a million pieces. It's kind of like this, this next week you're washing grandma's plate in the sink and you drop it and it shatters and that piece of china is never going to be the same. It's never going to go back together again. It's in a million pieces. This is what creation was suffering from. And so Jesus came and lived a perfect life. The Bible tells us that Jesus, God in the flesh, he was tempted in every way just like we are but did not sin. He experienced everything there is to experience when it comes to the human condition. The highs and the lows and everything in between. And he was given a trial in a kangaroo court. He died on a cross as a common criminal. And it was his death and resurrection that, that brings restoration to our broken world. It was his death and resurrection that brings restoration to the broken places of your life. He literally, through his death and resurrection, has glued our lives together, the shattered pieces of our lives. He has scooped up, taken up, and put back together, and it's more beautiful. Our lives are more beautiful in him than they were apart from him, right? And the foolish things of this world, the weak things of this world, you and I, are made beautiful in the hands of the master and the greatness of our Savior. And this all started in a place called Bethlehem with the birth of Christ, if we were to look at Bethlehem in the first century, there's absolutely nothing significant about it. It was just a plot of ordinary dirt with some ordinary folks trying to eke out a living. 
But at the end of the day, it was a town too that no one knew about, no one cared about unless you were from there. It'd be like if someone from the East Coast said, where are you from? I'm from Austin, Nevada. Where's that? Well, it's south of Winnemucca. Where's that? It's in Nevada, right? No one cares. <laughs> but God had plans for this place, this place called Bethlehem, this ordinary place in the forgotten realm of the Roman Empire. See, 700 years before Christ was born, through the prophet Micah, God had this to say about Bethlehem. He says, you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. God looks at Bethlehem and says, hey, you're ordinary, Bethlehem. And I go, oh, thanks. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring a ruler that will rule over Israel out of you, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. I'm going to do something significant, something extraordinary in you, Bethlehem. And of course, this is pointing to the birth of Christ. Now, before we get to the birth of Christ, though, I want to talk about the town of Bethlehem because it shows up a few times in the Bible. The first time that we hear about this place where Jesus would be born was when a guy's wife named Rachel dies. Rachel was the, the wife of Jacob, and out of Jacob came the 12 tribes of Israel. And when Rachel passes away, we're told in Genesis 35 that she was buried in this place called Bethlehem. This is the first time that we hear of this place. The, the second time that, that Bethlehem comes up in, in the Old Testament is when um, there's this lady, Naomi, and she, she and her husband and her two boys, they leave Bethlehem and move to Moab because of a famine. And there her sons marry Moab, Moabite women, one of them named Ruth. And then all the men in their lives die. And Ruth and Naomi come back to Bethlehem. And if you know the story of Ruth, it's one of faithfulness and, and one of God paving the way for the king of Israel. And, and then the next time that we hear about Bethlehem is um, when this, this um, prophet named uh, Samuel shows up at this guy's house named Jesse. Alex talked about this last week. And, and says to Jesse, hey, God told me to come here. I'm, I'm going to anoint one of your sons as the next king of Israel. And so let me see your sons. And, and Jesse's all excited, brings all his boys before the Lord and, or before uh, Samuel. And, and Samuel says, no, nah, none of these guys are it. You got anything else? Like anything in the back? Like you forget about one? And, and Jesse says, yeah, we got this kid, David, small kid. Doesn't matter. He's a, he's a shepherd. We'll go get him. And he becomes, he's anointed in that moment as the next king of Israel. And this all took place 300 years before Micah said, hey, out of you, Bethlehem, is going to come a ruler. A full thousand years before Christ would rule, David was anointed as the next king of Israel, and Jesus would have come from the line of David. So why, so, so we see rather that this, this plot of land had a special place in God's story in the Old Testament. We know, too, that it had a significant place in the Christmas story. All right, we go back to Luke chapter 2. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And, and this is a Christmas story. We know the story where Mary and Joseph went up to Bethlehem. And this is where Jesus would be born. And in this story, I, I feel bad, like my heart breaks for Mary. Keep in mind, she's in the first century, she's a, a teenager, she's pregnant and not married and the talk of the town. That doesn't bode well for her. And, and now her pledge to be husband says, hey, we got to go to my hometown of Bethlehem. It's 90 miles away, five-day trip, know you're pregnant, but we got to go because some knucklehead in an ivory tower uh, says, hey, I want to know how many people are in my, in my place here, and they, they want the census. And so they travel there. And there's something amazing, though, again, about this dirt, this, this town of Bethlehem. God made a promise 700 years earlier. And it was a census that, that brought the, the movement of this young couple to Bethlehem where Jesus would be born. So you think out of this town come two incredible leaders. Like, you know that, that, that arch that we have downtown, right? Biggest little city in the world. I think if Bethlehem were to put up an arch, it should say something like, like uh, small town, two great leaders. And you could just drive your donkey right under it, right? Because you got David as the first great leader, a man after God's own heart, the, the best king, the, the most renowned king in the history of Israel. And then you have God, Jesus, God in the flesh, born in this town, comes from this town, and he would go on to rewrite history and the human condition and the effects of sin on creation. And all this happens in this plot of dirt 
called Bethlehem. If you were to look at the name of Bethlehem, translated, it means simply house of bread. House of bread, and that's kind of neat to know, but it takes on new meaning when we look at this claim that Jesus, who came out of Bethlehem, makes about himself. See, at one point in his ministry, Jesus was teaching and healing, and, and there were, uh, he was always drawing a crowd. And in John chapter 6, we, we read about this crowd that has come to him, and, and uh, one of the guys notes, hey, they're probably hungry, and Jesus said we should feed them, and they're like, we don't have food to feed them. And he says, well, what do you got? And, and some little kid has the sack lunch. And he's like, well, give me the sack lunch, kid. Like, let's do this. And so with that sack lunch, we're told that Jesus feeds 5,000. But, but it's more than 5,000 because they're only counting the men that day. And so it was probably uh, over 10,000 people are there, and he's fed all of them. And after this, Jesus says, all right, I'm out. And he goes across the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and some of the people follow him there. And when they get there, they're not amazed at the miracle. They just say, hey, Jesus, we want more food. Like, that was kind of cool back there with the sack lunch thing. Can you do that again? And Jesus gets frustrated with them in John 26, or 6, verse 26 and 27, and, and, and they kind of fire back. They're like, hey, Jesus, just so you know, um, when our ancestors walked with Moses in the desert for 40 years, God provided manna from heaven, bread from heaven. So like he took care of them that way. Can you do that? Like, you got anything in the fold of your robes that we can have because our bellies are hungry again? And Jesus goes, time out. Let me tell you who I am. And in John chapter six, he says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now it's kind of lost on us. There's seven of these I am statements in the book of John. And when Jesus says, I am, he is linking himself back to God's declaration of who he is in, in Exodus when he says, I am who I am. For the listeners, the Jewish listeners today, in that day, that would have been offensive because no one aligns himself with God. But here Jesus has, and he says, hey, I'm God in the flesh. You got to understand that. And here's the deal. When you come to me, you will never be hungry, you will, and whoever believes me will never be thirsty. Why? Because I am the bread of life. From the house of bread, this, this kind of forgotten plot of dirt in the Roman Empire named Bethlehem, house of bread comes the bread of life. What does Jesus mean? Does that mean he's like a marble rye or a sourdough? You're like, I like that. It'd be better for our communion, wouldn't it? Don't say amen. <laughs> well, we know bread is the most basic food. You can survive on bread and water for a long time. When we think about breaking bread, it's synonymous with sitting down and eating together. And this food that we eat is necessary for life. It sustains us. And the people that day thought, well, Jesus is going to give us bread that will fill our bellies for a few hours. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm here for. He goes beyond that, goes deeper than that, and says, no, I will sustain your very souls. He is the bread of life for eternal life. And they kind of missed it that day because they're like, hey, Jesus, we just need some sustenance, some nourishment for the next few hours, and you go, no, you don't even understand what you're asking. If you come to me, I'm the bread of life. You will not be hungry. You will not be thirsty. Some of us need to remember that. Some of us need to hear that today, that when we go to Jesus, the things that our soul longs for to be made whole, to be healed, to be restored, man, we find those things in Jesus, not the things that we pursue and when we find those things in Jesus, the, the bread of life come from the house of bread. Man, he takes our lives and, he, and we move from ordinary to extraordinary. And God did this with this town of Bethlehem, ordinary dirt under the feet of Jesus. And I love, absolutely love that nothing is beyond the artistic ability of God like a kintsugi master. When we come to Jesus, the bread of life, he can put our lives back together. He's in the business of taking the broken things, the forgotten things, the messed up things, and making them beautiful again. We see him doing this in the town of Bethlehem, and I've seen God do this throughout the world today in some pretty tough places. This last summer, I, I got to spend time with a young man that is a friend of mine in, in uh, Kenya. His name is Jesse, and, and I've seen him grow up. When I first got to know him, he's about this big. Now he's a high schooler, and he's like this big. He's enormous, and the guy is completely in love with Jesus. And, and when I, I, I got to hang out with him at this boarding school um, outside of Nairobi, and uh, he's there because of, you'll see some pictures in a minute of where he lives, and the option of living in Devoney Boys School is much better. 
But when I was there this summer, he said, hey, can I share with you about my love for Christ? And, and his desire is to be like a, a preacher, uh, spoken word, uh, rapper. So he's totally following in my footsteps in all three of those. <laughs> that was hurtful that you laughed. Um, <laughs> but he shared with me the spoken word piece about his heart for the Lord. And, and I'm gonna give us a list, but a couple of things on this. Number one, he uses his stage name. Number two, the audio is kind of bad because, well, it was a little bit windy that day. And he's got a bit of an accent. But I want you to listen in on his heart for the Lord and see what God has done in his life. Check out this video. My name is Shepard. I'm a Christian, yes, I love my religious. Nothing else, only talk about Jesus. Forgive, he gives me hope to see my future. I believe what he says, man, is to pray. Having the faith and just to wait. Jesus, I love you, you know that I do. And if I had the chance, I'd just come to you. How beautiful, the things that you do. You're the king of the jungle, commanding the mission. You see the vision and bring on provision. Care about creation, preventing temptation. I hate the formula, you showed me the similar. Proved you a king when you took off the keys. Even Satan himself is bound on your feet. I love to sing, gave me the beat. Gave me sponsors who sponsor my dream forever. I live to call you my king. Nothing pulling me back. No, no, I'm not going down. You loved me before I was born. Ask for me and I'm ready for you. Send me please and I'm ready to move. I have no fear. I believe I'm a winner. I change of my lifestyle of living like a sinner. Prepare like a soldier to take all of doers. No plan A's, no plan B's. I'm speeding up my gear. No turning around. You're coming towards the wall. Very prepared. We armored with the word of God. We are no waiting. Going to Canada as a home. I'm standing firm with my army armed. We got no aches, but we believe in God. Yeah. I was both a cameraman and a cue card guy, so I was doing a lot behind the camera, trying not to cry during that because it's so incredible. So he got us taken, this young man, and uh, glued his life back together. He grew up in a place called Kiamaik on the Mathari Valley, and we've talked about it a lot. And this is where he would grow up. This is, where, this is his home. And, and God has taken the, the, the dirt under his feet, something more than the dirt under his feet sometimes, and pulled him out of that and glued his life back together and given him such an incredible level of hope. It's just a beautiful story of God working and taking the ordinary and making extraordinary. And when he shared that with me, I was absolutely blown away. I was behind the camera trying not to cry because I know his story. And I know what God has done in his life. And so let me run a parallel with his story and us here in Reno Sparks in northern Nevada. To be honest, if you didn't grow up here, this probably wasn't a place that was high on your list of locations to live in. Right, And that's okay when I, I see some nods and some grins, and we just know that's true. None of us probably gave this a, a second thought, but now we're here, and we go, this place is incredible. We love the community. We love the outdoors. We love the vibe of this place, and we wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But, but I want to go beyond just living here because I've been able to see incredible things come out of this northern Nevada community and the dirt under our feet. Man, we shared some of those things earlier at the start of the message, and some of us raised our hand and said there have been significant spiritual encounters in this space at 7075 Pyramid Highway. Just some normal, uh, overly expansive soil. That's what the geologists call it, so we have to build a really big platform over there for that building. But anyways, we got us done stuff here. Like, I've seen, I've seen, like, super strong, like, doodly dudes, studs, bend their knee in humility and weep before the Lord as they realize their need for a savior. I've seen those that are hurting find hope and healing as they come into this place, shot up in life, ruined their lives on the rocks and just kind of dashed everything and no hope and they show up and they meet Jesus and they go, I can't believe I get to live this way because of what God has done. I've seen those afraid to pray like, how do I pray? What do I pray? What if God doesn't listen? Does it go beyond the roof? What if I sound stupid? And they begin praying out loud in groups, and people go, man, thank you for that. I've seen people, man, step into serving who didn't think it was in their wheelhouse. That's too big. That's too scary. I'm not equipped. Step into serving and find such incredible levels of joy and fulfillment. I've seen students gain a heart for the Lord and such incredible uh, fearlessness as they go into their classrooms and the hallways and the lunchroom, the cafeteria, whatever, and share their love of Jesus. And I gotta be honest, man, the schools are not a place that is conducive to Christian faith right now. And we're sending our kids in there and they're like, man, I love Jesus, you come to student ministry with me. It's incredible. 
I've seen neighbors caring for their elderly neighbors. I've seen those with like angry people with anger issues in their life. The knots come untied as they meet Jesus and they begin to laugh and cry and seek forgiveness and, and there, there's just joy in their life. I've seen so many people figure out that Jesus really is the bread of life who sustains their very souls and it is glorious. And for me personally, man, I've seen God use this community to allow me to, to kind of grow me up and allow me to preach and to lead I've seen how God has used this place to, to weed out these, these areas of insecurity and even pride, and it hasn't been fun at times, but God has done that. I've seen how God has used this place to grow up around me in an uh, incredible church that loves the Lord and is headed places. And, and I wanna be honest, I got to pastor in Virginia for three years. It never felt like home. Our whole time there, and, and it was one of those things I didn't realize until I got back to Summit, that we were never settled there that God had something in store for us with that sand under our feet, because we're at the beach, that part was awesome. But he had something in store for us with the dirt under our feet here. And, and like, I've seen how God, like a Kintsugi Argus man, artist has glued back the broken places of our lives as we get to do life together. And here's what I know to be true. Many of us have been blessed by the dirt under our feet here. Many of us have. And there's so many more in our community that need to hear the good news of Jesus and need to know that Jesus really is a bread of life that sustains our very souls. This is why we exist. This is why we talk about inviting others. This is why we're building this building. This is why we have invite cards for Christmas Eve services. This is why we went Christmas caroling. This is why we ask for jackets. Apparently, we raise jackets now, not sheep. And we send those. That was a fun comment he made in the announcement. So we send those out to people in need. And this is why we do everything that we do, because we know the difference God has made, Jesus has made, the, the bread of life and, and the dirt under our feet, and we want to invite others into that. So here's my challenge for us. First, to realize how amazing the story of Christmas is and how Jesus can glue back the pieces of our lives. Many of us who have been walking with Jesus for a long time need to hear that and be reminded of that and still know that. And there's some of us here and online Man, they need to understand Jesus wants to take your broken, shattered life and glue it back together and make something beautiful with it. Second is I want us to consider just how God is using this place, Reno and Sparks, Northern Nevada, Summit Christian Church, to do something extraordinary in our lives. My encouragement for us is to not let this place be a dead end. I arrived here and now I'm done. My encouragement, too, is not allow this place to have the kind of the stepping stone mentality. Well, I'm here for a season, but I'm going to go on to something even greater beyond that. And instead, let this place, this normal place with the dirt under our feet, be the place of work and movement where we experience God, where we build community, and where we impact lives as we engage with God and this fellowship more and more. Allow God to do something incredible right here, right now with this ordinary dirt under this ordinary building under our ordinary feet. See, in just a minute, we're gonna worship. And I would encourage you to stick around for it, both here and online. We're gonna sing the song, God, Turn It Around. It's a great worship song, asking God to take the places that are broken in our lives and turn them around. Asking God to restore those places in our lives. It's a song of hope. But before we get there, I wanted to take a second and offer the opportunity for those who are not walking with Jesus, who have not had their lives kind of put back together and glued back together by the ultimate Kintsugi master to do just that. See, the reality is we're all sinners. The Bible's clear on that. And the story of Christmas is God in the flesh wanting to do something about it. So he entered the world and he died on a cross for your sin and for my sin. And he beckons us to come, to be restored, to be made whole in his presence. Right, like this week in my quiet time, I came across Ephesians 3.12. I've read this numerous times, but maybe it's like for you where all of a sudden there's like the, the light bulb moment on a scripture that you read over and over and over again. You go, oh my gosh, that has new meaning. Ephesians 3.12 says, in Jesus and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can come before God, the creator of the universe, and stand in his presence with freedom and confidence, not arrogance, but an incredible level of humility of I cannot believe that you died on the cross for me as sinner, Lord. And our lives are put back together. Maybe today is the day for you in this room, for you online, that your life is put back together by Jesus. And it begins with a prayer 
of welcoming Jesus into your life and making him Lord of your life. And I'd like to lead you in a prayer. You can pray this in the quietness of your heart. So why don't we bow our heads here and online as well. If you want to say yes to Jesus today and pray this prayer, Lord, I come before you now. I'm a sinner and I don't have it all together. And my life is shattered and broken and not what I wanted because I've been doing it apart from you. So Jesus, in this moment, I surrender my life to you. Would you glue my life back together? Would you take the bits and pieces and brokenness and do something remarkable, something extraordinary with it? Would you help me as I walk with you? And Jesus, for us as a church, Lord, I thank you that we're a church where people are making decisions for you. I thank you that we're a church where broken lives are being glued back together. I thank you, Lord, that we're a church where we look at the ordinary dirt under our feet and we're amazed at what you're doing with it. How you're growing us and using us and blessing us and providing for us and protecting us and rebuking us when necessary. God, I pray that we would go out into the world knowing that you, your son, rather, is the bread of life, that you sustain us, and you send us into the world to tell others about you. Help us in that, Lord, and bless us. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Listen, if you made a decision today, whether here or online, we want you to text today to the number on the screen so we can follow up with you and let you know about the next step. You made an enormous decision for the Lord today, and that is to be celebrated. And so make sure to text today. Now, Beyond that, we're going to worship. We're going to sing this song, God, Turn It Around. So would you stand with us as we worship?
turn it around, God turn it around. Amen. It was so awesome to be here with you this morning, and we are so excited to see you in just a few short days for Christmas Eve services. Have an amazing rest of your weekend.